morning, good morning, good morning. It's so lovely to see all of you from across the globe today. My name is Laura McBain. I am the co-director of the K-12 Lab. And first and foremost, thank you all for showing and showing up in this community today, especially after we have had such a tumultuous um, launch this past year, going back into schools and hybrid mode. So thank you first and foremost to all the educators who are here on this call today. Um, I feel very grateful to be introducing my two colleagues, Perry and Jeremy, who lead and design our executive education division at the, at the Stanford D School. Um, today, uh, they come from a wide range of experiences. Perry coming uh, formerly at the CEO of Patagonia, Jeremy releading this idea of creativity um, within his own context, as well as across the education and executive education division. And both of them together bring this powerhouse of inspiration and creativity and also deep humility to how we serve everyone and bringing design and making the world a better place through the power of creativity and design. And so just first and foremost, thank you to them and thank you to all of you. Um, today's topic is actually one that I think Perry and I had this inspiration about, about a year and a half ago. We're in person and we were iterating about this idea of this idea of parallel prototyping, multiple ideas. And um, this workshop is about how we actually test multiple ideas at once. And if you've been in a school this year or in the past two years, you have probably had to parallel prototype many ideas at once, probably your schedules. About one day your schedule was this, the next day it went online and the next day it went hybrid. These ideas of all of a sudden you've got one idea and then things have shifted and you need to try something different. This idea of paralleling um, different possibilities in order to make change. And so today, uh, Jeremy and Perry are gonna be talking about how we actually prototype, how we design a process for coming up with parallel ideas. Um, I can't begin to be more excited about this session. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of conferences uh, in my day. And one of the things that people say at the very end of a conference is, what are you gonna do Monday? What's the one thing that you're going to do? And I love doing that. I, I write it down, I've led those exercises. And the one thing that I think is missing in those exercises is this idea that I should have lots of ways forward, not just one. Because as soon as you bring ideas, something shifts and you need to find a new way forward. And so with that being said, I'm excited about sharing and turning the mic over to Perry and Jeremy, who are gonna talk about how we prototype parallel possibilities and how you can bring this idea of thinking in multiples in your design work and really thinking about how you can test and leverage the conditions and the context you're in and come up with creative possibilities and not just one way forward. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off to Perry and Jeremy and we will be in the chat, live chatting the whole time. So if you have questions, please shoot them in. It looks like Perry is coming to you live from the Stanford yeah, campus. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. And it's, and it's winter here. I had to actually put on a fleece. This is it, the folks. Hoover Tower in the background, the main quads over there. Uh, it's a lovely day here. So it's great to see everyone. Uh, we hope to, as Laura said, a, you know, uh, run through um, really uh, maybe some broader concepts about experimentation. Um, we're going to give you a choice. It's, it's going to be a choose your own adventure uh, afternoon. Um, I work closely with Jeremy doing all kinds of things at Stanford. Um, and this topic of experimentation is something that's embedded in every bit of it. I see there's some, some former students, um, some alumni of online programs. So you know that we, we, um, we teach this topic anytime we're teaching a design class. We also use this parallel prototyping or, or more broadly this concept of experimentation in the accelerator we want to run called Launchpad. Um, and with that, I think we'll run a poll um, unless you want to, do you want to reveal the results, Jeremy? I can't tell on my computer if the results are as to where folks have come from as they've answered that. Um, I don't know if we take it personally, Jeremy, that like 10% of our students are coming back to see us again. I think, I think it's a good sign. I think word's gotten out. I don't know. That's, that's what I'd say. 
All right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Looks like a lot of you are here for the first time, which is great. And a bunch of you have come to MOC events before, which is awesome. Um, maybe we'll start just by with, with some very uh, simple but powerful provisioning, which is the following. You know, at the D school, we loosely teach people how to come up with ideas. But inevitably, when I say I teach people how to come up with ideas, the response I always get is, how do I come up with good ideas? And there's this fixation on good, which is a problem, which we talked about a little bit in the first session, and we're going to talk about a little bit next Friday as well. Um, good doesn't enter into the picture when you're seeking to generate, right? So that's well established. But it does beg the question, once I generate a lot of ideas, how do I know if I have a good one? And I want to start just by telling a couple of stories that illustrate some of the dangers of seeking to learn if I have a good idea. So one of the dangers that we've observed is with a large real estate company that we've worked with in the exec ed group. And uh, they had a, a challenge in a mall. They, they run malls all around the world. They're one of the largest real estate companies in the world. And they have a mall where on the fourth floor of the mall, there are uh, tenants moving out. And they called a you know, frantic all hands meeting of the executive team and said, what are we going to do about this crisis of our tenants moving out of the fourth floor? And so I want to invite you into the room with me as we kind of eavesdrop, because there, the challenge is there's beautiful paintings on the fourth floor. There's panoramic views of a beautiful downtown on the fourth floor. And the question is, why are tenants moving out? And as they start digging into it, what they realize is there's very little foot traffic on the fourth floor. Nobody's coming up there. And this is perplexing to them because they had invested so much in making the fourth floor a desirable destination. And so they started having a brainstorm. And at some point, the winning idea came up, which was, we should put a beer garden up there. That would really drive foot traffic. You can imagine people at the end of a long day, middle of downtown, on the way home, they're going to stop, head up to the fourth floor and, you know, uh, drink their cares away, so to speak. And cooler heads, thankfully, prepared, uh, prevailed. You know, you go, okay, that's an idea. Is it a good idea? Well, what the team did was they went down to the first floor of the mall and they surveyed about a thousand people over the course of a few days. And they asked people, if we built a beer garden on the fourth floor, would you come and, uh, and partake and patronize? And over 80% of people that they surveyed at that location said, if you built it, we'll come, right? And so... Uh, equipped with that data, the team in invested about two or three hundred thousand dollars in retrofitting a portion of the space, and then with much fanfare launched their fourth floor beer garden. Um, in the months that followed, they were disappointed to see there was no impact to the foot traffic patterns in the mall, and they actually came to us to help them unpack why. Why was that such a flop? What did we do wrong? Okay, so that's story number one. We chose an idea and we implemented it and it's no good. How could we have learned that earlier? Okay, story number two, working with a uh, casual dining restaurant with hundreds of locations around the United States. Um, they have the challenge of working with third-party delivery services that own the customer relationship. So you think about DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera. If somebody uh, has a bad order or a wrong order, who do they reach out to? They reach out to the restaurant, they reach out to Uber Eats. If they reach out to Uber, Uber blames the restaurant. Um, and this is really bad for customer relationships. So they've got an idea that says, uh, why don't we put a handwritten note in each bag with the phone number of one of the meal preparers in the bag? And if somebody's meals messed up, they'll call the phone number and we'll actually own the relationship rather than DoorDash throwing us under the bus we'll be able to rectify the situation and preserve a good customer relationship. Uh, they implemented that solution. And the next day we were debriefing the data. They had put meal, uh, they had put notes in something like 43 different to-go bags the night before, and they didn't get a single phone call. Is that a bad idea? Everybody sat around talking about, man, we really thought there was promise with this idea, but gosh, Back to the drawing board, right? In both of these cases, both the real estate company 
implementing a beer garden and the restaurant company implementing the note in the bag, uh, you know, uh, customer service situation, both of them lacked some basic experimentation techniques. And for different reasons, we feel they could have accelerated their learning and saved a lot of money and a lot of heartache if they had worked differently and if they had brought an experimental mindset to their problem solving. In both cases, with the real estate company and also with the restaurant, they could have dramatically improved their likelihood of success and the confidence with which they deployed an ultimate solution had they undertaken an experimenter's mindset. So we really believe, as Perry mentioned, that experimentation is the way to move forward. Um, we believe that for the vast majority of early stage ideas, experimentation provides an enormous floodlight on the path forward if only you're willing to work a little bit differently. But the question comes, how do we do that? Where do we do it? Which ideas do we experiment with? And so there's lots of questions that we would like to actually turn to you and ask you, what part of this lecture are you most excited about learning? We've got a poll here on the screen, if you can see it. And our hope is that we can hear from you what you're curious about learning more about. There's about 50 people who've responded. We'll wait a couple of minutes. I'll chime in too. I, people are doing the poll. I put in the chat, Jeremy, one of the things that I've seen a lot in schools is like these big investments in buildings, for example, like we're going to spend, and I've seen that a lot in big K-12 institutions and districts um, where they spend a million dollars on maker spaces. Um, I've been into a number of schools where they've spent a lot of money um, and then they're underused. Hmm. And, that, and that, I think that perpetuates this question about you're alterating about what is the need that we're trying to fill. And I love that approach. And I've seen, especially um, how we can experiment on these and low cost, right? How do we actually get started? Those two examples you described versus massive inf investment in time and money and resources versus low risk, low stakes and, um, experimentation that's really around behavior change. So I just wanted to, that example, when you explained it, I was like, oh yeah, schools probably don't necessarily put, um, exactly, in, in Mary's like outdoor classrooms, you know, things are another way expensive even inexpensive, but I think that that insight, I didn't think about real estate as you're describing, but I've seen so much in like the investment of big physical resources that often get underused or not designed for longevity. So thanks for sharing that example. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, Laura. Here's the, uh, here's the poll results. Um, it looks like at least half of you are really interested in this question of how do I craft a good experiment? And so perhaps, um, Perhaps we could dive in there just to begin with. Uh, I think Perry, are you gonna be manning the chat closely? I'm not able to watch it quite as much. Yeah, okay, looks like, looks like that's a thumbs up. So I'm gonna pull up our uh, slide deck here. And you might wanna fix your Zoom, sorry. Uh, brief aside, technology aside, if you go up to the top of your screen, you can hit view options, select side-by-side -side view, and then use the slider in between my head, which is probably really small right now, and I think inhumanly small, um, and adjust it so that my head's roughly the same size as the slide. You can make my head bigger if you want. You can make it much smaller. It's still a choose your own adventure. This entire experience is choose your own adventure. Um, okay, so it's, uh, it's cool. So, so we just asked, you know, which of these is interesting to you? And what we heard was, how do I craft an experiment? Okay. Um, so actually what's interesting is we can just go directly to that example of the, of the mall. What we recommended to the team actually was instead of building the product, they should be the product to put it very simply. So a really simple and elegant way to build a prototype is to build nothing and, and actually perform the function that's, that's uh, at the core of your idea. So for example, if you think about the the, the real estate example, the underlying idea, the function they wanna perform is give someone a beer if they get to the fourth floor. That's basically the function. Or give someone a, uh, the opportunity to feel like they can unwind on the fourth floor. Okay, that's great. Well, why not just get Perry? I mean, his hourly rate may be you know, uh, you know, beyond the scope of the project, right? But get an intern or get, a, <laughs> get someone to stand at the top of the fourth floor with a you know, pitcher of beer and 
a couple of cactus, you know, a cactus garden, right? You've got a beer garden technically. What's it? And so anybody who comes up, you can pour them a drink and, you know, give them a coupon for a free drink downstairs or whatever it is. But the interesting there is thing there is instead of going to the first floor and asking if we built a beer garden, would you come? What we'd recommend you do is put signs all over the first, first floor saying, visit the beer garden on the fourth floor. And you put curtains up, you, 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 may, you, you may get like a food truck kind of a situation, but you could, for a, for a really scrappy experiment uh, at a fraction, I mean, a, you know, 0.01% of the cost, by putting the offer out there in the mall, they would have, and then what are they measuring? They're measuring the number of times the fourth floor button is hit on the elevator. They're measuring the number of times that somebody on the escalator goes from the third floor to the fourth floor, right? And if you've got the, you've got one intern with a pitcher of beer, one intern holding a cactus, and one intern holding a clicker, right? If you want to get really uh, crazy, what you'd see pretty quickly is, wow, the proposition of a beer garden is insufficient value to drive foot traffic. Very simply, they would have been able to identify, but it's it's being the product. And a lot of times you can think about, for example, uh, we, you know, in a totally different space, Perry and I, as he mentioned, we run the accelerator. We've got students who oftentimes they want to create a marketplace. We want to create a marketplace where, you know, first time parents um, have, a, uh, have access to a marketplace of goods that have been lightly used by other parents of, you know, only children. I'm just making this up, right? Only, you know, parents of only children, their kids rarely wear through the clothes. They rarely wear out the stroller or whatever, right? They don't have little siblings messing it up. I have four children myself, so I would not be able to sell on this market, imagined marketplace. Um, that sounds great, right? Well, a lot of times what a, what a student will come to us and say is, I need to hire a developer because I need to build a platform and I need to build a website. And what we say is, hang on, what is your underlying value proposition? While I'm trying to get you know, parents of only children with stuff they don't need anymore to sell them to new parents who want lightly used goods. And what we say is make that connection. You don't need a developer to make that connection. You need maybe an access to a distribution list of you know, Stanford ParentsNet, for example, is a really great way to you know, put an offer out there to all parents, right? You know, I've got a stroller, anybody want it, right? It you can be very simple, but a lot of times folks think of building and that tends to be the really expensive part. But if you would instead perform the service, then you can learn much more cheaply, much more quickly. So that's, that's kind of a broad frame on how. We oftentimes will use this worksheet uh, as a way to help innovators frame what they're gonna do. So there's four, there's four parts here. One is your target user. So who is your target user? This is a worksheet that we give you. If you come to our office hours at Stanford, we give you this worksheet, right? The second uh, posted is who is, or what's their pain point? What's your target user's pain point? The third posted is what's the killer feature? What's the pain killing feature that you have envisioned in your mind? And then the fourth posted is what's a two hour experiment? So think about if you, if you have very, very limited time, what could you do to test the hypothesis here, right? And you're probably testing, you know, either does this user feel this pain or does this feature address this pain, right? But if you think in terms of very, very specific, a lot of times you can make progress quickly. Um, and so the, the other thing that we'd say on how is you wanna think in terms of cycles. So does anyone know why WD-40 is called WD-40? It's what happens when you put, an engineer in, front, in charge of branding, but I'm thought that's good. Um, what it means is water displacement 40. It was the 40th attempt of a well-funded team seeking to solve a well-defined problem in actually solving it. So they were trying to displace water in lots of different ways. It took them 40 tries, okay? Do you think it's gonna take more or less tries to solve the problem that is less well-defined and less well-funded in your own life? It's probably going to take more. But when we get to this question of how, again, the question we're seeking to answer is, how do I craft an experiment? One thing that's important to do is to set your expectation. I'm actually going to be undertaking a set of cycles or a series of experimental cycles. It's not, I'm going to craft one perfect experiment. I'm going to get the data and then we're done. 
It's rather, no, I'm going to engage in a series of experiments and I'm crafting, I'm executing and deploying, I'm collecting data. And then based on the data I collect, I'm going to assess that and iterate and recraft and redeploy, but I'm actually flying this loop, so to speak. And what we see is a lot of innovators get really discouraged. They do something one time and it doesn't work or you get crickets and they go, well, I'll give up. But I mean, to use the example or to, to reference the example that I gave earlier from the restaurant, they you know put these notes in 43 bags. They got no phone calls and they said, oh, I give up. I said, well, hang on. Let's not declare defeat so quickly. Tell me a little bit more about how we crafted this experiment. What do we do, right? And after about 10 minutes, what we realized collectively, there's 15 people sitting around debriefing this experiment. What we realized is all of the meals were perfect. So is it any surprise that no one called to say that their meal was messed up? No, because of all of the effort in the kitchen to deploy this experiment, people, they had more, you know, bag checkers than they ordinarily do on, on the food line. And they actually had, they had a high degree of confidence that every single order was perfect. So is it, is it an indictment of the idea that if an order's, you know, um, messed up, that they would be able to call an actual person's phone number to get it, the situation remedied, is that underlying idea now invalidated? Not at all. They actually haven't tested that idea yet, right? Because nobody had a messed up order. But the point is, oh, that, that actually wasn't, it wasn't about setting up the perfect experiment the first time. It's about setting up a system to continuously learn and iterate and deploy and refine over time. That's well, actually Jeremy. what... Yeah. Jeremy, I'm going to interject because I think there's an interesting sort of um, uh, complicating factor. I think this is a really good example to talk about, which is Great. we talk about good experiments are ones that you can get a resounding no and maybe talk a little bit about that psychology. I think it's, it's fascinating and it's, it's how we actually define a good experiment. Um, and it's something we usually put in a different area in this talk, but it's, it's relevant to a couple of the questions that have come up on chat. Um, which is what, what that company didn't do well was they didn't realize a really amazing outcome of a good experiment is a resounding no, it didn't yeah. work. Instead of propping up and in, in uh, we teach students all the time, if you have this range of, you know, a range of absolutely love it to completely hate it in your experiment in terms of the reactions, that's, an, that's gonna be an amazing experiment that's gonna help you figure things out. That company got stuck in this, in that what we see is a, you know, a complicating factor, which is it's really hard to hear no about a new idea. It's really hard to hear it doesn't work. And we, this is something we, 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 um, we value experiments that return data. The data can be about what not to do um, as well as what to do. Yeah, it's a great point, Perry. I mean, if you think about, uh, you know, experimentation comes from where? It comes from the scientific field. Uh, I was just talking with a friend the other day who's a designer, you know, by night and a scientist by day. And I was asking her, what's the biggest difference between the scientific mindset and the design mindset? And she said, scientists expect to be wrong. They're highly skeptical of their results. And so you, you conduct, you know, a thousand experiments, you get no, 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 but they don't, they don't say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a failure. They say, of course, well, I'm expecting to test a bunch of different reagents, a bunch of different catalysts, a bunch of different reactions. And, you know, did the cell turn green this time? Go back to the drawing board. Did it turn green this time? Go back to the drawing board. And she said, what I've noticed actually is uh, scientists are way more comfortable getting a no because it's still data, it's still information, it's useful. And she said, the other thing is, if a scientist gets, if all the cells are green, they don't go, I did it. They're green. She said, they're really skeptical. Uh, let's try this five different ways and see, are they really green? Did that really work? Whereas a lot of times with innovation, we get the slightest indication. Somebody likes it. We go, we declare victory. We did it. Right. And so there's this, there's this tendency to want to be right um, rather than actually learning what works. And getting no, as Perry was mentioning, getting no is a fabulous way of learning what are the boundary conditions here that actually will help you identify the right problem to be solved. And I'll chime in because this is I put something in the chat for you all because I think it really reminds me a lot of, um, I've been in a lot of districts where we're like, we have a new initiative, whether it's project-based learning, 
maker education, design thinking, whatever it is, there's usually some initiative that people are always thinking about. And, and, and really, a, they're usually well-intended, right? This idea of bringing ideas into the, into the space to help young people. And I think one of the things that happens exactly um, on point, Jeremy and Perry, is that we get the idea right, right away. We're like, oh, this must be the pathway forward without giving and listening to the wrongs first and really understanding why oftentimes initiatives that get started fail is that I think sometimes we don't spend a lot of time in the wrong, right? Understanding why it's not gonna work and really leading into a lot of experimentation before we invest a ton of resources, launch new initiatives that require everyone to do it. How can we really get deeper into what y'all are talking about, which is this idea of being wrong and listening to those wrong voices because that data I think, you know, in my own opinion, some gets crossed over, you know, it's perceived as folks don't want to do something, they're afraid of change, it has whatever excuses that comes around with that. And I think your question of like, where do we get it wrong is actually really important data for all of us to think about in K-12 when they're explicitly launching new ideas or new initiatives. So thanks for sharing that insight. Yeah, we've got some friends at a venture studio in New York called Prehype, and they, they, call it the uh, default dead mentality, meaning they start with, this is not a good idea and we should not put time in it. Can we prove ourselves wrong? And, there, and the burden of proof is, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, innocent until proven guilty or bad idea until proven good. Whereas a lot of times we, you know, we come up with an idea, we go, it better be good, you know, and it's, and it's good until proven bad. And that just, there's a lot of cognitive biases there's a great activity you can do. Let me see if I could find this. There's a great article that you could read. Just Google uh, quick test to test your, don't do it now because hopefully this is interesting enough that you won't. Um, but if you go to this New York Times article, it's easy to find, but it's a great, it, it shows the implications uh, that there's, there's cognitive biases that prevent us from seeking very important data. And the bias is simply, we don't like hearing no. So we frame questions in a way that we're likely to get a yes, even when a no may actually be far more useful to us in the early stages. So that's a great example. Perry, are there other interesting questions in chat or should we go back to the poll? I think this, um, this topic of um, getting a no uh, provoked a lot of um, different reactions from folks. Um, and I, I think the, uh, it's not in, um, I think one of the comments I wanted to call, I think Netta made this comment in there. We're not saying that you don't want good answers and people to like your thing. And then it's, it's not there. One of the questions was, aren't they getting no, good information me? regardless? Cause they're engaging with no, customers and they're out there, you know, um, engaging. Absolutely. And a whole other, it's like, um, they're playing the piano, but only in one octave and it's teaching the students you know, sometimes you can learn stuff from a resounding no as much as you can learn stuff they were learning things in that case um, by putting those orders out and having everybody on the line and doing it perfect. They were learning how to do it perfectly. That might right. be interesting also. Right. If they put it together, that's the magic of experimentation and multiple experiments. Well, and, what, and what's cool too is, um, I mean, so there's a bunch of stuff here. I'm just going to kind of go off and we can go wherever direction we want. One, I, I'm curious, I'm thinking about the Michelin example of going off road, Perry. So come like, remind me of that. But two, you know, AB testing is a phenomenon that's, that's in software development, right? You never just do one thing, right? So you, you, if you want to know what color the button should be, make it three different colors and send a third of your traffic to each one and see which one converts, right? And that's, you know, that, you know, I hate it on ways when it tells me to go somewhere I know is slower because I know what I'm a data point. They're using me to kind of learn. <laughs> and so I sometimes ignore ways, even though sometimes it's actually right, but that's kind of the gamble you take, I guess. But the point is in software development and in technology, there's this sense of the way we gather conviction about which way is correct is by deploying multiple pathways. And I love that actually, that picture of ways. You know, it, from point A to point B, if there's a thousand people, you know, making that uh, that trip, basically, how many different pathways are they experimenting with at any different time? They aren't telling all thousand of them to take the same way because they wouldn't be they wouldn't have all the data they need, right? You can think about that same that same thing is a very useful picture, I think, for any innovator. If we know our goal is to have this impact on this student or customer or whatever, our hunch might be that that you know answer X Y Z is the best. 
do we have a are we do we have an institutional instinct towards placing side bets as well? Let's try one, two, three, and let's try QR9 as well, like randomly, right? As well, because it's going to give us more relative data as well. And for for what I would say is that an A-B test requires a B, but a lot of times people don't have a B. They have an A, they have one idea, that's it. And yet what empirically we know from the research is teams are very bad at selecting their best idea. So the likelihood that you've chosen the best way of solving a problem is actually very low. And so, it, and so if there's a humble acknowledgement that we a priori, we don't know which is our best idea. And two, we have a bias to select the suboptimal idea then the natural conclusion should be, therefore, in the early stages, let's do more than one thing, right? And this gets to the core of this idea of parallel prototyping. And so for a leader, anytime the team comes to me and says, we're trying this, what should my response be in the early stages? What else are we trying? Not in an accusatory manner and not in a belligerent or adversarial manner, but just saying, are we doing other things? Or, or, because, wow, I want to have a lot of conviction that this is a good idea. And it'd sure be really great if I had relative data to be able to compare it to, that this had a 10x click-through rate, that this had a 10x adoption rate to the other thing that we thought might be a good idea, right? You're, you only stand to benefit from creating more data. Um, and yet it's not the instinct that many people, um, that many people bias towards. I, I flashed this uh, Mark Randolph quote up earlier, but it's worth repeating, especially in the early days of Netflix. He talks about how he and Reed Hastings were, they were deploying experiments and it take them two weeks to get data back. And he said, it's the, the, the cost of that data is two weeks, right? And so they realized, wow, it's taking us way too long to learn. And he said, but everything was perfect. We had all the copy perfect. Everything was just high and tight and just right. And he said, instead, what we started having to do is say, we have to sacrifice a little bit on the fidelity side. There might be some typos, but if we can get an experiment to yield us data in a week rather than two, we're learning twice as fast. And he said, now they're at the point where they're deploying multiple experiments per day, right? And their learning is just through the roof. But, it, but you have to see that, you know, getting back to this question of how, how should I prototype? One is quickly, or how should I experiment? If I'm framing experiments that are going to take months to deliver data, then my learning is exceptionally slow. And there may be some areas like the life sciences, right? Where you have to deploy a clinical trial. I understand that. But in the early stages, when you're really seeking to assess desirability, when you're really seeking to assess, is this you know, new function or feature going to have the impact on a customer or a student that I hope it will? What you wanna be doing is thinking in terms of hours. That's why our innovators hypothesis sheet specifies two hours doesn't mean that all the data necessarily will come in in two hours, but if you can't frame and, and launch an experiment within a two hour period that's gonna yield data in the near term, there's, you're probably spending too much time and effort on early stage data, we'd say. I'm not seeing the chat, Perry, so I'm just hoping anytime I pause, oh, I, you just I have, a, I have a fun digression, because Amy has a great question. It says, okay, you do a, you do a great experience experiment, and her question, I know, is, I know exactly the story you're gonna tell, it's a great story. Why do groups usually choose suboptimal decisions? Um, is there a study or something we could read about this? And I thought of the example of um, uh, working with a bank here locally uh, one time. Uh, oh. we went to a, see, do you wanna tell it, Jeremy? It's a, it's a great story. Yeah, who, who asked the question, Perry? Amy, he, is that right? did. It's just, it's just such a um, interesting, it's, it, I know that, it's, I love this group because there's a mixture of people talking about business and um, larger yeah. organizations and all this stuff. And I, I realize it's kind of maybe down the path of larger organizations, um, but nonetheless, it's no, just- it's great. It's a, a great, it's a great, um, it's a great challenge, Amy. What we've seen is the team that bears the burden of implementation almost always have biases that the rest of us don't. So a lot of times we are convening you know, radically diverse groups of people to solve problems. And the example that Perry's referencing is we had this amazing opportunity to work with a very large bank out here, probably the largest bank in our area. And they're trying to reinvent a bunch of different things. They had nine or 10 strategic priorities approved by the board for to put in flight a group of high potential innovators to work on. And we said, okay, for the purpose of training, these guys are going to spend, these gals are going to spend the next you know, months working on these various initiatives for the purpose of training in our mindsets and methods, let's just take one of the initiatives, we'll mix all the teams up so there's no ownership or anything, 
and we'll see what these folks do. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, groups of four or five uh, leaders uh, from across the organization are all undertaking in a diverse manner the the task of one of the groups that they're going to tackle in the months that follow. Over the course of two or three days, we start realizing there's some really cool stuff here. I mean, there's some kind of lame stuff, but if you think in terms of a portfolio, you are always going to have a distribution, some great stuff, some lame stuff. We believe that the lame stuff is the cost of the great stuff, meaning you don't get great without the lame. So we're fine with that distribution. The, the important thing is to have a, a, a a high enough volume and variance of output that you can get to the great stuff, right? So for us, we're delighted by that outcome. And we were so delighted, in fact, by the distribution that we said, wow, we should have the team that's responsible for this initiative is around debt financing for startups. We should have that team actually be the jury and they will get to select the, the, their kind of starting point. They're basically getting a jump start on their project. So I pulled the, the various members of that team out of their representative mixed up teams and said, all right, folks, you're going to get to be a jury. You're going to get a leg up on the rest of the teams. These guys have done amazing work. It's going to be great. Come with me and I'll prepare you to be the jury. And I made them a little jury form and stuff. Well, the teams start presenting, again, some amazing stuff, some totally lame stuff. And I'm looking at the jury's notes. We, we go to the look, at the look at the forms. And I'm thinking, at first I was like, this, do they not understand the scale? Like, does one mean best and 10 mean worst you know i was really confused because i noticed they're all gravitating towards objectively i mean from my objective granted certainly subjective but objective perspective as far as i can tell they're all choosing by far the lamest idea and i'm going what's going on here and then i realize oh this is great this is cognitive bias in the in situ this is amazing right so I bring the team back in. I say, okay, everybody, you know, you get, let's gather around. Pat, the CEO's there. The, you know, all of the senior leaders are there. And uh, we ask the team, all right, tell us which idea you selected. And they said, you know, we think the winner is team four. And there's just, you can hear a pen drop. I mean, it's total silence, right? <laughs> and and uh, finally somebody said, oh no, I asked, um, just, just out of curiosity, raise your hand if you would have chosen that idea. And maybe one hand out of, you know, 40 or 50 in the room went up. And one of the gals on the team, the responsible team, said to the group, are you serious? And multiple people echoed back to her, are you serious? Right? And you could just see in real life the tendency of the team who's, who bears the burden of implementation. What are they thinking about? They're thinking about feasibility. They're thinking about integration with existing systems. They're thinking about time to market. They're thinking about existing technology, right? They're, they've got all of these burdens that cause them to view the, the possibility set in a very particular way. Whereas outsiders, you know, I was talking to a, to a woman who's on a board just this morning and she was telling me how it's amazing from a board perspective the different perspective I have on the business. And then there's a CEO that she had been working with. She's on his board and he just retired as CEO. And now he's on the board and he said, and she told me he was telling her, it's amazing the opportunities I see from a board perspective that I wasn't seeing when I was running the company. But the point is that the perspective matters and what all the other 45 innovators in the room could see that this small team of responsible five people could see was there was possibility in many different directions and what, what seemed like the safe bet to that team was anything but safe in the context of innovation. It was actually the riskiest bet because the safe thing to do is pretty lame and it's not going to deliver outsized returns over time. And so for us, one of the things that we say um, is, I'll, I'll uh, even show the slide, but we say, trust your ahometer, right? You, there's, we all have this sense of delight whenever we uh, think about ideas. And it's important to be dialed into that sense. So which idea should you move forward? Probably the one that you'd be excited to see living in the world. In the early stage, there's so many impediments and there's so many obstacles and there's so much resistance you face. If you aren't excited about the idea, it's, it should be a non-starter. I mean, if you have autonomy, if, you're, if you have agency and you're able to select from among many ideas, you should only choose ideas you're excited about because there's going to be so much resistance, so much opposition to doing anything new, just institutionally. If you don't really believe in it, 
don't even bother. You know, and you can ex post rationalize with some matrix of a net present value and all sorts of different variables. Usually, you know the answer pretty quickly. And so for us, that's, that's actually become a much more important variable is which one is the team excited to deploy? And if they're excited, I'd rather actually let them do something that, they're, that I'm skeptical of, knowing that that's going to preserve their momentum and enthusiasm. And I can, just like you can turn a moving ship much more easily than a ship that's standing still, a team that's enthusiastic, even about the wrong thing, one, I have to acknowledge, I don't know what's right from the outset. And two, if they have a means by which they can quickly discover whether they're right or not, then they can pivot and make yeah. much more progress moving quickly. I'll jump in because I've, I've been watching the chat too, y'all, and it's really fun. I see some folks like our friends from New York, superintendents, and I think the highlight, which is I think so important, and I think I think Chuck put it in there, is the folks who often are generating ideas aren't in charge of implementing it. And so much, and I think it's coming up in the chat with school systems and are such big bureaucracies. And we say, okay, yeah. here's an idea and y'all got to do it because you know people aren't involved in the co-creation of the ideas to begin with. Right, and I think, not, not invented here syndrome. That's right. And I do think it really hits on a challenge that's facing so much of K-12, of public education and all education is like, we want to be innovative and the, the, and exactly as Sarah Matthews is saying, schools don't pivot quickly. So how do we create a culture of pivoting, right? This question of actually it's okay to be wrong in small, low risk ways, as Perry was saying, right? Because the risk of being wrong in high risk is actually so big for schools, you know, it's particularly when we're caring for young people and being of service to them. And so like this question of like bringing everybody in. And I think the thing that's really interesting to me um, coming from the K-12 space is as we do these experiments, we get to see the, the potential unintended consequences of our ideas. Yeah. So many of the folks on this call I know are coming in thinking about how we do really great equity work, how we serve our students who've been most underserved in our system. And so sometimes we just launch into initiatives that we think are going to work without having everyone in the room to come up with these great ideas and really thinking about how we see what is the what is this idea and who is going to be hurt by this, who is going to be uh, helped by this, and how do we see not just the, the multiple possibilities, but the multiple possibilities of impact, right, and consequences of the ideas. And I think the parallel prototyping and impact goes go together really well, really seeing what is the consequences of our ideas and how, who's gonna be helped and who might be hindered by some of these different questions. So thanks for sharing that. That's great. Hey, Jeremy, I got a, uh, there's a great question. I think it's, it's completely on topic and, and worthy of the whole group. Jenny asked about, okay, great. You know, I've got this, in, this incredibly complex thing. It's a, her thing's about a database and it's gonna have a rollout and it's got multiple constituents. I can imagine all these things. The, the question is to phrase it for, I think the benefit of everybody is, you have a really complex idea or it's, it's likely what you're going to be doing is really complex. Um, how do you, how do you, how, how do you start? And I think this is something that reminds me of something we've learned a lot about from Launchpad of an, an earlier question. I can't remember who asked it um, about assumptions. And what we do is we, we break the problem down. And Jeremy, I don't know if when you want to go to that, that desirability and talk about, we really sort of focus on the desirability part. Um, and the kind of questions we ask, so students come in and we have a, um, a student now in the accelerator working on a, on a platform that allows um, uh, sort of burgeoning thought leaders to produce really effective experiences they can run people through and sort of broaden things. It, it helps them produce short videos. It, it helps them sort of build out their area of expertise and, and share it more broadly. And so, this he comes in all the time. He says, well, my experiment is I need to build the platform. I need to get, you know, a couple hundred people on it. I need to, you know, um, prove the economics. I need to prove that I can do it technically, all these things. And we say, well, let's just even if this is one way to look at the, uh, you know, the assumptions is, you know, let's just, just let's just assume, you know, one of your assumptions is true that technologically, eventually you'd be able to do it. Um, viability, eventually, if it serves something, you can, we'll, we'll put off those experiments, those are assumptions you're making in, in, in this endeavor by starting it. Let's ask a different question. If it, if it existed, would people want it? And it started this experimentation for the student around, well, why don't I just show one of these people what I, what I would do for them? And I can sort of pull together a bunch of um, images and just quickly show them and see, it, does this resonate? Does this solve the problem? 
And it was an example of jumping to the end and, tr and doing your best to answer the question, what am I going to deliver something that's desirable to my target user and experience? So it's almost at the, um, uh, showing, showing the results of this experience. So if, if it's this complex system, what would somebody get? What might be a results page if it's a platform online? If it's an experience at a store, what, what would they get in the package? Just show them that before you do all the things you'd need to do to make that happen. And you'd experiment with each one of those, but start with these desirability experiments first. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's really helpful sometimes. I mean, a, a scientist will do this, right? But to actually define what does success look like before we undertake it, because it's easy to ex post rationalize why anything we did was a success later. But to say, you know, to use a silly example from my friend Philippe at Michelin, you know, if I say, hey, I've got this idea, it's a goat lawn mowing business, it's eco friendly, you know, I don't use lawn mowers and I feed the goats and, you know, there's a petting zoo that the, you know, my customers' children can visit, whatever, right? Okay, I think it's a good idea. How do I know, right? Well, I'm going to put door hangers on my nearest 100 neighbors' doors. Right. And I'm going to put my phone number on it. And if I don't get at least 10 phone calls in the next week, I'm going to, you know, then I then I don't think it's a good idea. Right. So that's very simply, it doesn't have to be really sophisticated, but to say this is the number of phone calls that I'm that I'm this is the threshold I'm going to set that determines whether I think it's a good idea, right? And then, I'll, you know, I've got to invest in a trailer. I got to go buy some goats, right? But I can make those door hangers, you know, today and I can put them on people's doors and it'll give me kind of an order of magnitude indication as to whether that's a desirable function to be performed and desirable feature in the marketplace. But setting that out before you get started is very useful because if you wait till afterwards, it's really easy to parse the data in such a way that we've already decided this has succeeded. Let's just figure out how it succeeded, right? And that's kind of a, that's not a very intellectually honest place to be, but it's a place a lot of us find ourselves because we've decided to do something. Now it's just a matter of proving that we did the right thing. And this kind of flips that on its head. Claire, you're muted. Are there other um, questions coming up in the chat or should I look at it? One thing I will say, by the way, just while there's a, a pause oh, here. Sorry, Jeremy, I'm, I'm trying to catch up on there's so many, so many comments, but it's, um, I, I would continue on to what, a, one, a lot of resonance what, around that. The, uh, what strikes me as so interesting is it's, it, we, Jeremy thought it was so fun to let people choose the direction of the talk. It's fascinating how it's it sort of bleeds into these these bigger things that you know we we would sort of categorize differently and in, in a way it's a um, it's really interesting to start we always do this last Jeremy when we teach <laughs> whatever it's like it actually is better to start with this first start with the question here's yeah. one thing that I'll say just because I think it's kind of fun is there to me there's experimentation isn't only for deciding which of your ideas are best it's also for discovering better ideas. And I think that's very important. If there's not a habit of experimentation and a muscle and a capability that's being developed and cultivated and used, you're likely to miss inspiration. And I love the, I love the story of Bill Bowerman, who's the co-founder of Nike alongside Phil Knight. And famously, you know, I, I don't know if, if many people know this story. To me, it's like, a, you know, in the annals of innovation, he's sitting exhausted at his breakfast table one morning and he's watching his wife make waffles and it dawns on him that is the perfect shape for the bottom of a shoe and he yanks he unplugs the waffle iron takes it in the garage famously pours polyurethane in it destroys his wife's waffle maker but then he buys a new one and figures it out and that's kind of the birth of, Ni of nike as we know it um and a lot of us can go okay how do you know do, do i just like stare kind of absent-mindedly at kitchen appliances, you know, Steve Jobs had a thing for Cuisinarts, like, is that, is that the solution? Um, we'd say yes, if, if you have a habit of rigorous experimentation, what you, what I haven't told you, and what you may not know if you just know the waffle iron story, is Bill Bowerman, he was the head coach of the University of Oregon, he was also the, you know, U.S. Olympic track and field coach, um, but he had this maniacal focus on improving his runner's performance 
through experimentation. And so Phil Knight jokes that you didn't know whether you're going to be running in cod or kangaroo. You know, you didn't know if your insoles were going to be uh, out of the shoe. You didn't know if you would win the race or hobble off the track bleeding. And Bowerman always kept two notebooks. He had one set of notes around his athlete's performance, and he had another set of notes around his experiments performance. And he was constantly experimenting. And that's, if you think about it as a, from a soil perspective, that's the soil into which the seed of the waffle iron can fall. And a lot of times people go, I'm just waiting for, you know, yeah, I'm ready to experiment. I just got to have my idea. I'd say in a way you're kind of, you've got it backwards potentially. And an attitude of experimentation and a cycle and, a, and, a, and a, a discipline of experimentation oftentimes leads to inspiration that you never would have discovered if you hadn't been in the experimentation game. And so, you know, we like to say, just like luck favors the prepared, inspiration favors the rigorous tinkerer. It's a little bit less, it doesn't roll off the tongue quite so easily, but it's the same basic idea that getting in the habit of experimentation is a great way to court inspiration. And instead of just thinking about inspiration that happens as something after inspiration, it's actually something that should, often does and should precede inspiration as well. Yeah. Hey, Jeremy, so the one thing that's, that's come up a couple of times in chat, and I think it's worthy of a, a at the sort of recap level is, um, and maybe pull up the founder's hypothesis sheet is, we, in teaching experimentation, we, what's, what's hard to do with, with students found, you can imagine founders, they're in love with their thing, they wanna launch a company, they, they get so wrapped up in the results of that two hour experiment. We, we line up these hypotheses, these experiments, these results on a, on a whiteboard and we force rank them and we force rank them by the amount of learning, you know, and, and how little time was spent, little time and effort. And what's, what it helps students see is that what we value is this skill of experimentation. The best experiments are the ones that are always really focused on that desirability, um, took a little bit of time to put together, um, but generated a really clear, um, if you will, clear data that, that the founder or the student is able to actually make a decision from. And that's, that's one of the things I think that we've, we've learned over time is to not get wrapped up in the results and the, oh my God, this is so interesting. You know, this, this result, you know, is about the customer experience and it's, oh, you know, whatever. And, um, but, but backing up and saying, well, if that student spent two days putting that together and some other students spent half an hour, we want to really inspect the, the student that spent half an hour. If they, if they learn quite a bit, we'd rather have them, as Jeremy said, that, that's how we teach this fast iteration. These really being, being nimble quickly crafting an experiment, quickly generate data and actually be able to come back and process. I'm just realizing that it's five till. So, and there were a few things I was gonna share uh, just Perry, maybe while you're looking for one last question. One is we'd love to help your, to get your help spreading the word for sessions like this. This has been invigorating to get to share some of these ideas with a totally different kind of audience from what we ordinarily think about. So if you're, if you're willing or if, you, if you've enjoyed yourself um, that if you scan that with your uh, smartphone, it will auto populate a tweet. Sorry, I didn't think about doing something for people who are on other platforms, but that's good for Twitter. Um, and uh, let's see, Perry and I are both on LinkedIn. You can find us there and uh, you can connect with us. We love being connected with folks. Um, a lot of these ideas are coming from a book that we're working on right now called Idea Flow. If you scan that, it'll pre populate a text message to me. Uh, and I'll send you a sample chapter if you're curious to read a sample chapter. Um, no pressure there, obviously. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that next Friday, uh, Dr. Catherine Segovia and I will be doing a session on uh, cultivating creative practice, what we're calling updating the creative operating system. So that should be a lot of fun. Um, and we get into habit formation, get into really kind of some of the personal aspects of creative practice. And we'd love, I think uh, that's been a part of the announcements of the Master of Creativity. Uh, but just while you're here, we figured we'd mention it. And then lastly, and we'll, we can send a link to these as well, but all these slides and more, because because this was a choose your own adventure lecture, we didn't even cover all the slides. If you want to get them, you can go to uh, bit.ly.com slash Stanford -E -E for educators edition three. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that. And then I don't know, maybe I could stop. I'll, I'll share the, here's the Twitter thing one more time if you wanna do that. I'm just holding these up for like five seconds each. Just gotta hit send fast, I know. Here's the uh, text message thing if you wanna do that. <laughs> there's Perry and me. And then I think there's one more, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because there's one more slide, Laura, that I'm gonna grab if you guys wanna. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll share just a, a final thing is jumping in and we're sharing some links and different experiences. And, you know, one of the things that you're seeing is our experimentation in process. You know, I, I will just headline exactly what we're doing here, you know, and a back up a little zooming out, if you will, is one of the questions that um, we have at the D school is how do we understand across contexts and across domains and across sectors. And so one of the questions that Perry, Jeremy and I have is, how do we learn together about um, the different domains that are happening in the world, whether it's nonprofits, school systems, for profits, the range of organizations. And so what you're seeing in real time is literally an experiment that we're doing together around de-siloing content. You know, me jumping in and say, this is how it works, because one of the challenges that I have seen in K2 is that we're so de-siloed. We are so we're so siloed that we don't learn and what's going on and how do we help our young people thrive in an uncertain world if we as educators are living in just one sector? Can we learn across sectors? And so this is literally an experiment around what we're learning, right? It is a low cost for us. You're offering it for free to you all. And we're trying to learn about the needs that everyone has across these different domains, whether it's K-12 education, nonprofit sectors, as well as for-profit, because we believe just like design that we get better when we're con continuing to learn across multiple perspectives. And so we're learning, of course, about how like we can learn about what are the challenges facing K-12 edu education and how does that analog challenges fit in business, right? And how do the challenges that fit in business fit into K-12? And that's something that we're aspiring to do at the D-School is learning across sectors because we think that is learning, that is multiple perspectives, multiple sectors is where the world is going. So how do we get better at that? And you're witnessing a prototype in action right now for us to kind of come together and share. And I will share um, one quick thing, my colleague, um, I'll drop the link in as well. Yes, Jeremy, I will show the slideshow. Let me get it up, ready to go. Um, one thing I wanna offer up uh, for everyone really quickly is we are doing um, another prototype or experiment um, is our friends at the Designing for Social Systems um, team is launching what they call a design action lab. It should be coming up in about five seconds. Um, and you'll see the bit.ly there and I'll drop it in the chat. But this is a, a sprint that is designed for uh, design teams. And it is a cross sector. We've got folks from the business sector, K-12, nonprofit, and it is a, a spring sprint. You'll see 16 sessions. There are stipends, there is tuition and reimbursement sorry, tuition, uh, um, you know, reduction as well. But these are for design teams and they will be really thinking about this 16 week sprint of taking on really wicked challenges that folks are facing within their context and working within their own team as well as learning across teams from different sectors about how to solve those challenges within their context. So I'll drop the link in the chat. The um, application is available and you can send some information if you're interested in having your team uh, join in this new experiment that we're launching at the D-School. <laughs> oh, people, great to be with you today. Uh, look forward, if you've, uh, if you've sent me a text message, I haven't checked my phone. It's on airplane like a, like a good teacher, but I'll, uh, I'll look for it soon. So all the best to you all.